call to order the April 2nd meeting of the Brentwood <laughs> Board of Aldermen. If you'd all rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Here, roll call, please. Okay. Alderman Demet? Here. Alderman Kramer? Present. Alderman Leahy? Here. Alderman Lockmiller? Here. Alderwoman O'Neill? Here. Alderman Plefka? Here. Alderwoman Sims? Here. Alderman Wagey? Here. All right, that means we've got eight, and that's a quorum and a full house. Welcome, everybody. Uh, item number three on tonight's agenda is the approval of tonight's agenda. Are there any suggestions or changes for this evening's agenda? Any uh, objection to approval by acclamation? Seeing none, it'll be so approved. Item number four on the agenda is consideration and approval of the March 19th minutes of the Brentwood Board of Aldermen. Are there any suggestions or changes? Alderman Lockmiller. On page five under public works, uh, second line where it says uh, Gumbersheimer, that should be Grunenfelder. Gave us the uh, items for 2018. Oh, yeah. It's a little typo. Should it be on line yeah. three, two? Mm -hmm. No, that's yes, stage. It should. It should. Mm -hmm. Line two. Okay, any other changes? Alderman uh, Leahy. Your Honor, I'd like to clarify are we dealing with the March 19th minutes or the amended March 19th minutes? That's amended. a really good question. I believe we should be I'm, looking at the amended March. Yeah, well, the, both of mine say amended, so, you know. Well, there was a, a regular set that was in the, in the packet, and then there was one this evening at our place. It's the amended minutes. That amended we should minutes. be working to. Yes. Yes. So, uh, Mr. Lockmiller, I'll ask, is your change already in the amended minutes? No, it's no. no. Okay. Simple copy. All right. Are there any further changes to the March 19th amended minutes? No. Seeing none, is there any objection to approval by acclamation? They will be so approved. Thank you. As amended by, uh, well, wait, wait, wait. I guess that's going to take a vote. Sorry. I'll sec yeah, I'll second his amendment. All right. Is uh, all in favor of uh, Steve's amendment? Say aye. 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 Uh, any opposed? Great. Now they're approved by acclamation as amended. Um, all right. Uh, item number five on the agenda, we have a new firefighter with us, and I'd ask Chief Curtin to come and take over. Good evening, Mayor, Board of Aldermen. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, as we typically do, I'd like to read you a brief bio on Don Bushdiker, our newest employee. And uh, Don was born and raised in St. Charles, Missouri. He graduated from St. Charles West High School in 1999 and attended St. Charles Community College to pursue a degree in computer science. It didn't take long for Don to realize that the thought of spending his working career behind a computer screen was not how he wanted to live. <laughs> Don began his new journey to pursue a dream of becoming a firefighter paramedic and enrolled in EMT school at St. Louis Community College and shortly after began volunteering for Lake St. Louis Fire District. Don graduated paramedic school in January of 2012 and was immediately hired by Merrimack Ambulance District where he worked for the district until September of 2017. Don then attended the 100th class of the St. Louis County Fire Academy and graduated in March of 2017. He worked briefly for the Frontenac Fire Department from September until being hired by the Brentwood Fire Department in March of 2018. Don now resides in O'Fallon with his wife Heather and their twin daughters Isabel and Gabrielle. I'd like to introduce Don and have him come on up. faithfully demean myself that I will faithfully demean myself in the office of firefighter in the office of firefighter for which I was appointed on the second day of April for which I was appointed on the second day of April 2018 2018 okay. he 
convenience. Okay, yeah. very good. Uh, a tradition in the fire service is typically have a badge pinning ceremony right after a person's sworn in. So Don has chosen to have his wife Heather pin his badge on tonight. One of you two is which? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, we don't have any proclamations this evening, and the next thing on our agenda is a public hearing. Uh, we are going to have a public hearing tonight on amendment to uh, Chapter 400, which is our planning and zoning code. Uh, and tonight's amendment has to do with a proposal to. Uh, amend the code so that the uh, language of our code makes it clear that short-term rentals, uh, also known as Airbnb or similar, are prohibited by the Brentwood Code, the zoning code. Uh, Tom, do we have a synopsis? Or? We do, Your Honor. All right, if you would read that, please. Happy to. Technically under, this is uh, language of bill number 6191, the text amendments to continue prohibition of short-term rentals in the residential districts urban development districts and the urban development districts of city of Brentwood. This is case number 18-01. Short-term rentals are defined as rentals of dwelling units for typical periods of less than a month. Currently, our city's zoning code does not specifically define short-term rentals. However, since short-term rentals are not permitted by right and do not comply with the city's occupancy permit program, short-term rental operations have been prohibited. Our Public Works Committee requests the Planning and Zoning Development Department uh, to propose text amendments to Chapter 400, the zoning ordinance, to clarify the current prohibition of the operation of short-term rentals in our city. New definitions are proposed for short-term rentals, transient guests, and vacation rentals, which would be added to the definition section. The home occupation provisions would be amended to prohibit short-term rentals, boarding houses, bed and breakfasts, hotels, and similar facilities. The district regulations for each residential zoning district and the UD district would be amended to clarify that residential use does not include short-term residential use by transient guests, for example, short-term rentals. Lastly, additional language concerning occupancy permits would be added to clarify that short-term rentals cannot qualify for an occupancy permit. At the March 14th Planning and Zoning Commission meeting for the City of Brentwood, the Commission then voted three in favor, four opposed on the bill prohibiting short-term rentals. This bill prohibiting short-term rentals then moves forward to our Board of Aldermen for consideration with an unfavorable recommendation to approve from the Commission. This is included within the language of Bill Number 6191. All right, thank you. Um, so the way this works is I'm going to gavel open the public hearing. At that time, if you would like to address the Board of Aldermen on this potential change to the Planning and Zoning Code, then you can come forward if you'd please state your name and address for the record. Uh, we'll give you a chance to make whatever comments you have and uh, we'll take them under consideration. Uh, with that, I'm going to open the public hearing on the proposed amendment to Chapter 400. If you'd like to address the Board, come on forward. Sure. Um, I'm going to ask that you not prohibit. Could, could you state name and address oh, for the record? Yeah. We'd all know it, but. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Kathy Thomas. Address is uh, 9016 Madge Avenue. Um, so I'm here to ask to not prohibit based on the following reasons. Um, currently, we do have several operating in Brentwood, and they are unregulated and allowed to operate without much recourse from the city. Um, some of the pros and cons that I've heard mentioned at the planning and zoning committees, the cons were kind of stranger danger. Well, my friends coming into my home are stranger danger to all of you. 
you have no way of, of a background check at all. Whereas at least with the organized websites, such as Airbnb, VRBO, HomeAway, there is some modicum of a background check. My friends coming to stay in my house, nothing. So I like that there is that bit of regulation. Um, loud and disrespectful guests. Again, the city has very little recourse, whereas if we put the regulations that PNZ is um, handing down, I don't think they're discussed at this meeting. No, actually, the, so the proposal on the table, just to be clear, is the text amendment to prohibit. So uh, if, if, the, if the board would act not to uh, take the recommendation and include this in the code, then it would be prohibited, right? right. If the board does not take up this bill, if the bill does not pass, then the code remains prohibited, but un, not as clearly prohibited, in which case I'm assured that the Planning and Zoning Commission will be forwarding us a potential change to that. So. And they have the right. Yeah, and, yeah, of course. Um, so with the loud and disrespectful um, guests that people are complaining about now, right now there's no recourse. With regulation, if you vote to not prohibit, um, with regulation you can monitor these, find them, and revoke the license to operate if it continues and it, it goes unchecked. Uh, the third, uh, well, the transient. People keep calling these transients, you know, the people who stay in these Airbnbs. I, I for one, have used them, I, and I know that several of you on the board have, and some people in the galley, what do we call them? The people behind Peanut me. Peanut gallery? <laughs> <laughs> I was trying well, not to yes. say it, because um, I'm part of it. Uh, so. In all the research also shows that having these in the town increases property values. As a business owner, there's, there's research. I'll, I'll share it with you if you want. Um, as a business owner and not speaking um, officially as a board, board of director on the Chamber of Commerce, it just makes sense that more people coming into our town equals more money spent here. And there is research to support that as well. Um, and also positive exposure for future residents. People do come here looking at homes and need a place to stay while they're, and want to experience the neighborhood that they, they are looking in to buy. All right, last thing I wanted to say is the state is eventually going to pass this. And I know that it, this issue has been visited by, well, at least PNZ, I don't know how often you all have visited this, but why not go ahead, stay ahead of the ball, and get this done because eventually it is going to get passed by the state. So we might as well have our regulations in place so that we can regulate and monitor and revoke licenses and, I mean, big fines if you're operating without after you've had one revoked. So, um, and once again, I ask you to vote to not prohibit the, uh, <laughs> the bill. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else care to come forward? I see Ms. Smith making her way to the podium. Karen Smith, I live at the Harrison Motel. Um, I know the bill before you that you have tonight is to prohibit the Airbnbs. Um, and I also know the Planning and Zoning is also working on, on a bill that would allow them, but with regulation. I know that I'm swimming upstream because this is a very popular um, hotel motel option. Um, but I'm against allowing them because they don't achieve the goal of what our residential zones, um, you know, want to accomplish. And I think some of the um, inf uh, verbiage on the first page of the ordinance um, kind of summarizes that nicely. You know, that they're recognized by courts that the residential character of a neighborhood is threatened when a significant number of homes are occupied not by permanent residents, but by stream of tenants staying a week, weekend, a week, or even 29 days. Um, has some other verbiage, but then later says, rentals undoubtedly affect the essential character of a neighborhood and the stability of a community um, that here today, to, gone tomorrow, um, uh, kind of nature of them. Um, so they, the prohi prohibish, uh, prohibiting the short-term rentals also ensures access to the city's finite housing stocks for those wishing to reside in the city full-time and contribute to the stability of the community. And I do believe that, it, that, that what uh, those words represent are, are true, and I know I'm swimming upstream on this. Um, it's, you know, it's popular, I know, for many, many people, um, and they are great until you have to live next door to them. Um, 
and the neighbors that live around me, and they all say that these are very popular with the younger generation, um, but the neighbors around me, are several of them are young, and they couldn't agree more. They said, you know, I used to love staying in these, but I don't when I have to live next door to one. Um, some on planning and zoning have indicated that my neighborhood is perfect because of the size of the homes. They're two-bedroom bungalows. But I really actually feel that there's opportunities for all sizes. There are some corporations that bring in teams of individuals, and having housing stock west of high school will be just perfect for that. And if we do that, believe you me, I'm going to start promoting it. Um, I understand that Airbnbs have um, a self-correcting feature through their rating systems, which screen out people. But you will find that there are many um, issues with it. It doesn't catch everything. Um, and we just, we're going to need to be able to have a way to um, enforce if we do allow these. Um, and because I, you know, the problems do arise. Um, they also say that they contribute to our community by shopping here. Um, and eating in our restaurants, but so do the people that live here and, and, and are full-time residents. Um, also, if um, I don't believe these people that will be staying in the short-term rentals will contribute to our schools. Um, they don't serve on our committees. They don't know our ordinances. Um, we've had, we had one operating across the street from me, didn't really observe the parking, and the police I know went, went up and down the street numerous times, but they were never ticketed. Do our police have time to be stopping and writing tickets and checking out the Airbnbs every you know, every day to make sure that they're following the ordinances and of, of our community. And that's really not the role of what the police is supposed to be doing. They're not supposed to be regulating in, in that way. Um, they don't follow our occupancy. Uh, you know, they have many more people in, in there than uh, uh, is allowed by our occupancy role, rules. Ho the hotel and industries have staff that are on site 24 seven that deal with issues that come up. If you're a resident or if you're a person staying in a hotel and the person next to you is loud, um, or there's issues with security, you can, those are dealt with. And I'm not sure, you know, they've talked about having, um, you know, some sort of management system company, but, you know, there is no, um, you know, 24 hour service that is actually responsible for those Airbnbs. Um, and I guess I would end, um, well, one other thing to say in regards to if we move into more of the regulations instead of prohibiting, I do wonder if our staff will have the staff to actually regulate them. And I guess, each of, I, guess I would ask each of you to think of whether you would like living next to one of these establishments and how you would like your kids living next to one of them. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I'll remind the board that the opinions of the people speaking at the podium are not the opinions of the mayor or <laughs> Mrs. Thornton. <laughs> Hello, I'm Pam Thornton, um, 9421 Tillis Drive. And you usually don't see me here very often, so this is uh, unusual for me. And we don't always have the same opinions on things, and that's how come I wanted Sometimes I keep my mouth shut because I feel like I have to, but sometimes I just have to speak out. So here I am. Um, I have no interest in having an Airbnb in my own home. I have a property in Brentwood Forest and I have no interest in that turning into an Airbnb. However, I do believe that having short-term rentals partly the government shouldn't be involved in how I use my property. Um, as long as I'm not doing other things, if I want someone to stay in my property, I believe I should have the right to have someone do that. Um, I do think that there are ways that we can permit it. Um, it's hard to enforce whether you have Airbnb or not. We don't have the staff to say, um, to find out if someone has an Airbnb and we've, we've already it's against regulation. So if someone's hosting one, we'll never know because unless someone complains about it, no one's gonna know about it. Um, so there's no way to enforce it one way or the other without having a lot of time and energy into it. So I would just ask that we not change the text to prohibit, that would prohibit it for positive, but to look at ways of regulating it. Um, I think even St. Louis City is looking at ways to permit the process and maybe set up different categories. So there is a lot of different categories of um, short-term rentals. You rent your whole home all the time on a full-time basis. You rent a room out of your home 
because um, you have extra money, you have an extra room, more like a border in your home. That's been happening for ages. That happens all the time. It's just now there's an easy access that you can find it online to find out where those are easily available. Um, and then also, every once in a while, you're going to be out of town for a month, and it just happens to be the month that the Super Bowl is going to be here. Okay, rent your home. I mean, that happens all the time. Other places, now there's just another way to do it. So there's a lot of different categories as an insurance agent. I know State Farm is just now addressing that issue. They finally changed their policy and made things to look at on it, but they've taken their time. It's a changing and evolving industry, um, and I just think that Brentwood could be on one of those areas where we have to keep up with it. It's like Uber, it's like Lyft. It's going to be around. Let's embrace it. Let's make it work for us. Let's use it to our advantage. I agree with Kathy on everything she said earlier. Thank you. Thank you. Isn't she cute? <laughs> Anyone else care to address the board? Uh, Mike Horton, 2527 uh, Cantlin Drive. I'll go ahead and even it up two, four, and two again. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the first thing I'd like to bring up is, uh, uh, so let me say this, my only legal training comes from Google, so I am going to throw this uh, point to the city attorney. Um, right now, the revised statutes of Missouri Section 315 uh, address rentals and things like that in the state. Um, if you change the regulation, if we change our definition and allow it, by my reading, we are actually going against the state regulation. So, so uh, 315. Again, I'll defer to uh, people who are smarter than me about that. Um, I will say, though, uh, in my research, while the point was brought up that this is changing in the state of Missouri, the last time the legislature did anything with this was approximately two years ago. I believe the House resolution was 2662. I didn't write it on when I transcribed my notes, but that was 2016 that it was proposed in the uh, House to change the language for the state of Missouri that would allow these short-term rentals. That bill died in committee. There has been nothing done since, so stating that we are moving, the state of Missouri is moving forward. Uh, there may be proposals, but they have not made it to the state legislature. Some of the other things that happen when, when, we, when a hotel is set up, the Drury Inn, for example. The Drury Inn came in, they proposed what they were going to do. The Board of Aldermen looked at it, planning and zoning, everybody looked at it. And there are some things that they have to comply to, okay? They have a business license. They have inspections. They collect taxes, state, local, and I believe the county has an entertainment tax. Uh, I know the city does. All of these things a business complies with. By allowing these uh, short-term rentals, whether it's Airbnb is the one that most people know, but there are a few others out there, um, they're operating a business. Where's their business license? Where are their inspections? How are they collecting the taxes? So a business complies by the rules. By saying, yes, we'll allow the Airbnbs, we need to make them comply by the rules. Uh, another couple of things, um, and this is just in the research I've done, some of the pros and cons, a discussion about whether the owners are on site. All right. If people are renting their property and they're going through some management type uh, thing, like a rental company does, um, we've got owners who have apparently come through the city or should have come through the city for an occupancy permit. Um, but if they're not on site, they're not complying with their occupancy. And I don't mean just for a few days. Um, I could certainly see some place like Brentwood Forest, and I know uh, Mrs. Thornton said she would not be interested in, in renting out the uh, property she owns, but there are other people who might. 
and that would cause a problem, in my opinion. That is not the, uh, the purpose of uh, Brentwood Forest to rent out those as short-term rentals. And anybody who knows anybody who lives in Brentwood Forest knows what a problem the parking is. We would have bigger issues, and I know part of that is, a, is management for Brentwood Forest to deal with, uh, but my mother-in-law lives there, and boy, she's really protective of her space. So, um, One final thing I'd like to bring up is anybody who starts a business, has a business, let's say that I wanted to, I don't know, build an ice cream shop. As I'm building my ice cream shop, there are many things that I have to comply with. And I've already mentioned the business uh, licenses, the inspections, the taxes. Uh, one thing I have not heard, one thing that's very big in this country, one thing that we are spending millions of dollars on, well, not us, but MoDOT, uh, one of the big things that they are doing along Brent, or, uh, Manchester Boulevard, uh, Manchester, one of their big things is making all of the crosswalks ADA compliant. All right, that's a buzzword. I work in a government building down at the Arch. I'm a federal park ranger for anybody who doesn't know. In our ranger station, they built us one about a year and a half ago. Uh, two years ago we moved in. They were just in working, uh, the contractors were working on our building because we had things like our sink was literally a half an inch too tall to be ADA compliant and they had to come in and fix that. Some of our signage was three quarters of an inch out of compliance and they had to come fix that. ADA is a very important thing in this country. I'd like to know which of these, these uh, short term rentals is going to be ADA compliant and how are we going to enforce that? I'm gonna tell you probably not, my own house isn't. And it would probably cost me a lot of money to make it ADA compliant. So uh, again, just to summarize, I don't think it's a good idea. Um, and we should change the language to not allow short-term rentals. Thank you. Thank you for those completely random examples. <laughs> <laughs> would anyone else care to come forward and address the board on this subject? Anyone? Going once? Going twice? I'm going to close the public hearing. Thank you all very much. Uh, that will bring us to item number uh, eight on the agenda, which we don't have any bids. And item number nine on tonight's agenda is the public hearing of any matter of public interest upon the request of any person present. So if you would like to address the Board of Aldermen on any topic, and I'm going to say any topic except short-term rentals since we just heard all about that. Uh, please come forward. You'll have three minutes. No one? All right. Uh, we have no unfinished business this evening, I don't think. Great. So that moves us into bills to be given a first reading. Uh, item number 11 on the agenda, 11A, is bill number 6190. Mr. City Attorney, go to a first reading by title only, please. Bill number 6190, first reading, an ordinance authorizing the city of Brentwood, Missouri, to enter into a lease purchase transaction, the proceeds of which will be used to pay costs for the, of the Manchester Renewal Project, and authorizing the execution of certain documents and actions in connection therewith. Thank you. Alderman Kramer, synopsis? Yes, Your Honor, a little greater illumination. Bill number 6190 covers the 2018 series certificates of participation, the COPs. Our city desires to enter into a lease purchase transaction and borrow $42,930,000. These proceeds will be used to pay for the cost of the Manchester Renewal Project. There are three parts of the Manchester Renewal Project, namely number one, the Deer Creek Flood Mitigation. The Deer Creek Flood Mitigation Project involves the planning, design, and the construction of improvements to the Deer Creek Channel, starting from the existing metro facility to the Union Pacific Railroad crossing in Maplewood. To address the ongoing flooding problems located along the Deer Creek Channel between Brentwood Boulevard and Hanley Road, the City of Brentwood proposes a project cons uh, constructed to protect affected properties from the 100-year floodplain and more frequent flooding. 
Manchester Road Improvements. The Manchester Road Improvements is a Missouri Department of Transportation MoDOT project consisting of one and a half miles of pedestrian and vehicular improvements to Manchester Road within our city limits of Brentwood. That project would consist of mill and overlay of the existing asphalt pavement, replacement of the existing concrete gutter with curb and gutter, partial access management of existing business entrances, and pedestrian improvements to sidewalks, pedestrian signals, and pedestrian crossings. In conjunction with the MoDOT project, the City of Brentwood is acquiring additional right-of-way space to improve the appearance and use of the Manchester Corridor. And number three, the Great Rivers Greenway Deer Creek Connector. The GRG connector is approximately 0.60 miles of extension of the existing Rogers Parkway Trail to the Great River Greenway's District's CRG Deer Creek Greenway. The CRG connector will connect a newly constructed below grade tunnel. The trail will continue south along the west side of Mary Avenue to Norm West Park. Continuing south past Norm West Park, users will utilize the approximately 1,200 feet of pedestrian bridge to traverse across the Union Pacific Railroad and Deer Creek terminating at the trailhead along the Deer Creek Greenway. This project involves planning, design, and construction of a connection between the city of Brentwood's Rogers Parkway and the Great Rivers Greenway's Deer Creek Greenway. All these items are contained in language of bill number 6190. Thank you. Uh, all right, so we have, uh, since this is the first reading, we have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, what I'd like to do is, is give everybody a chance. Uh, I think there probably will be a few. Um, we're going to kind of tag team them, though. So uh, I, what I'd like you to do is ask your question, not to anybody specific, address it to the chair. And then hopefully I can find the right person in the room to address the question. Um, and if you would, try to keep the questions related to, at the very, uh, to, to the topic at hand, which is the issue of the COPs, um, and, and not so much the project of the, as the whole, accepting that the project as the whole is the goal of the COPs, so I understand that, so, you know, but, uh, you know, I, I know a number of you have a financial interest in the outcome of tonight's game, so, you know, <laughs> <laughs> if we could move things along, that'd be great. <laughs> Kathy better entire re retirement on Michigan. Uh, <laughs> <clears throat> anyway, uh, so are there any questions from the board regarding Bill 6190? Alderman Plufka. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, so, Chair, um, generally speaking, what increase does this put on our debt service as it currently exists going forward, not just through the next, through the life of this, but as it pertains to the first several years and then at going forward from there? Right. So, um, as I think I sent out some information on maybe Thursday yep. that, that uh, addressed this question and a couple others. Uh, right now, for the past three years, the city of Brentwood has serviced approximately $1.45 million in debt per year. Okay. So, we have been paying on the firehouse construction. We've been paying on the construction of the rec center. And we have two capital leases that total uh, just a little under, uh, what, $125,000. So uh, if you add up those three debts, uh, our capital debt is $1.43 million, $1.45 million per year, uh, or sorry, $1.47 million per year. Um, if we were to adopt this measure, that debt payment would increase from uh, $1.47 million to $2.8 million. And so the increase would be an increase of $1.33 million per year in debt service. Uh, that would go to the paying off the debt that's issued by these bonds. Uh, that would be true until 2024, at which time the debt service would increase to a total of $3.2 million, which would be another 500000 on top of that. So the increase from current conditions to there would be something like $1.8 million. Does this delay, does that notch, that so-called notch we've been talking about, the notch that's here, does that delay the receipt by the city of any part of the $41 million that's no, being contemplated? No, not at all. No, the entire transaction takes place at once. The way it happens is the debt is, is tranched, and certain parts of the debt are, are shorter term and sh longer, lower obligation, and then longer term and longer, higher obligation. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I'm looking at the financial guys to make sure I, I tend to say things in simplistic terms because that's how I think, but, uh, you know. Uh, they'll correct me if I got it in play. Alderman Dimmon. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Uh, I believe everybody on the board has an email that I sent out this afternoon. 
And uh, yeah. thank you to, uh, to Bola and the rest of the staff for getting the answers together so quickly. Uh, it answers a lot of my questions, but I still have just a few. So uh, following up on what Alderman Plufka said, I appreciate the, um, the explanation to uh, our debt service and our total debt. Is there anywhere in the, in the documents that we have in front of us that spells that out? That says that our, our total debt service is going to be uh, the 2.8 um, for four or five years, and then it's going to jump up to, to 3.2 million. I appreciate your email that. that yeah, you I, I, I don't think specifically no, because I think the, the document in front of you is structuring this, this transaction, which of course does not include the other transactions that I was talking about. Okay. So this document would say that the debt that we're being taking on is uh, what about, uh, I don't know if I have the exact number, but it looks like, uh, well, an additional, for, well, $1.3 million in the first five years. one33 for five years and then one83 for... Hey, where, where are you looking? The remainder. Uh, I don't know where in the document it says that. All, all I'm just trying to get is, hypothetically, let's assume that it turns out the numbers are wrong mm -hmm. and we had to come up with more than what is in those graphs that are in front of us. Mm -hmm. uh, I'd like to be able to look to somebody and say, what went wrong? You know, how did the numbers, how is it that we came up with these, these numbers as opposed to just being the chair giving us the numbers? Oh, I'd feel a little more comfortable if we had it, that number in either exhibit, uh, I guess it'd be exhibit ABC, E, yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe. I, I don't know. So I understand the total debt is called out for in that, uh, in exhibit E, this is the $43 million. But what I don't see in that document is the amount that is necessary annually to service that $43 million. Does that make sense, my question? I think uh, Jim Leahy can probably help you with that. Yeah. Jim is from Stiefel Nicholas. Thank you. Uh, Jim Leahy from Stiefel Nicholas. A um, couple, couple comments to your question. Um, this is the guidance that we will take to pricing if, if, if you authorize us to proceed on April 16th. And so we will, we will price the bonds no matter what the interest rate is, we will structure that to be what you just talked about. So it will not exceed that. And when, you're, when we're back on the 16th, again, if you authorize us to do that, um, the numbers, the final numbers you will have in the documents in front of you at that time will reflect what we're talking about. So by the time we have our second reading, we'll, we'll have those yes, numbers? Yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Great. Okay. Um, the... The other question I have that we didn't get an answer to was uh, the ability to prepay this without a penalty. <laughs> I, I, don't, I don't want to give you my simplistic notion of that either. <laughs> so typically the, the bonds have a final maturity, I shouldn't look just this way, but the bonds have a final maturity of 25 years, okay? And it would be normal at some point in time, it's usually 10 years, for the bonds to be callable at, at par. If you said to us, you want the bonds to be, I'm making this up, if you wanted the bonds to be callable in two years or three years, we could, we could pr include that provision in there. It will have the effect of increasing the interest rate. Okay, that's the, that's the thing. So typically, uh, it's, it's eight to ten years at, at par. So if, if the city would be in a position it would want to refund these bonds for whatever reason at that time, you could do that and it with no penalty. Okay. Okay, well, cause the only reason I bring that up is one thing we talked about is if we go forward with this, we make the initial investment, turns out it's not really doable. Right. We then talked about possibly paying off this debt in, it, in the future. I'm right. just wondering, is that still a possibility? So what Jim is saying, I believe, and he'll correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sure, is that, you know, it, during the first 10 years of the transaction, no, right? We, we wouldn't be able to call the bonds. So uh, what we would then do is plan to call the rest of the bonds after the 10-year time limit is up. You know, there would be absolutely nothing, however, preventing us from selling, for example, particular right. assets and putting that money into the treasury and then, you know, saving that money to pay the bonds at the time, you know, the first opportunity. So, uh, you know, the <laughs> spread between the, you know, between the buy and the sell is all the difference that's going to be involved in that. So... 
you know, yet no, we couldn't prepay them, but yes, we could unwind the transaction at relatively low cost to the taxpayers. Okay. On uh, we're going to lose a lot more on the on the unwinding, I think, than the than the spread. On on page eleven of again, I believe it's Exhibit E. It's the um, it's the document that was on the, your day is in front of you tonight. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I guess it's actually the COP talks about the different sources of uh, cash flow available to, to service the debt annually. Uh, and specifically, I believe it mentions uh, TIF proceeds. Yes. Uh, the paragraph, the city's bond financing for its two TIF districts have stated maturities in 2023 and 2026. We're assuming that when those pay off, we think they're gonna be, number one, we're assuming they're gonna pay off one of them early and that it's going to result in an increase of $1 million per year in sales tax revenue beginning in 2024 that will be available for appropriation to the certificates. My question is, what assurances do we have or what went into coming up with that $1 million in sales tax revenue? So what we did was when we started considering uh, the structure of the transaction, we got in touch with Mark Grimm, who was the bond counsel on that. Uh, Mark went and reviewed the terms of those bond agreements, and Mark did a, <coughs> I, I would say, a rough estimate. Uh, and he came up with a number that was significantly higher than $1 million. It was something like, his, his best guess was $1.2, $1 $1.3, $1.4 million. Then what he said was, well, just to be safe, let's assume that the amount of revenue total from the projects, the two projects, there's two, the Meridian right. and the Hanley Station, will be approximately $1 million. So, uh, you know, it wasn't a detailed calculation. I can tell you that just the upper half utility taxes alone from the Meridian transaction, we ourselves have estimated at something like $220 million, uh, sorry, $220,000 per year. And, and, in, and we will stop paying those when the Meridian bonds expire in 2023. So right there is $220,000 that I know will be stopped flowing out of the city's treasury on that date because that's all our agreement requires us to do. So um, I don't know that I think it's much of a stretch to assume that all of the other taxes, sales tax, property tax, use tax, I mean, you know, mm -hmm. all of the other taxes associated with those projects would be a uh, total of a million dollars. So it, it, you know, again, I think that's something that we, you know, if you're really concerned about it, we certainly have Cook and Riley available to us to, to maybe do a more detailed. I, I, have, I have no reason to question it. Yeah. I just wanted to know the basis sure. for coming up with that number. Yeah. And that, that, that is Mark Grimm's uh, rough estimate toned down quite a lot for the service, for the purposes of being extra careful. Okay. He also used as a basis for coming up with that calculation the fact that we paid off early the Brentwood Point and Brentwood Square because we went through a similar gyration in 2014. Okay. So he has that history to look right. at in terms of um, supporting his, his projections. Right. Okay. Yeah, and for the record, I think the Hanley Station TIF is, is on track to go a year early. Right. I'm, mm -hmm. I, I do believe that that is still the case. Last, last I heard that was the case, and I believe it is still the case. Right. Okay, that's all I have. Thank you. Can I just ask a question, kind of piggybacking on sure. what Mr. Yeah. and Mr. Leahy, I wanted to ask you that question. <laughs> You're not getting away Sorry. that easy, Jim. Sorry about that. No so just to, just to build on what Alderman Dimmitt said, the, the issuance of the bonds is going to try to match this payback schedule rather yes, than hit that $41,900,000 right. number. Yes. It could be a lower number than that, depending on what the market is like yes, in April or, or or May or whenever this goes through. Yes, sir. Okay. And that's a, that's a yeah. We're we're not yeah. So that 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 might be confusing. So to it's not result. We are not structuring this transaction to raise a particular amount of money. Correct. Right. We are structuring this transaction to not exceed those debt limits. That right. was my point. I appreciate yep. it. Thank you yep. very much. I'll took stay. me a while to get I'll that. I'll stay. <laughs> 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 thank, you. thank you very much. Alderman Kramer. Yes, Your Honor. If I could, uh, Mr. Leahy. Yes. Good to see you, sir. Um, the question has come up regarding the timeline of the bond, uh, but the potential payback for this, the bonds or the maturity um, between now and the, uh, the maturity of the bonds. Mm -hmm. If an interested party ideally would come to the city and profess their, um, uh, their desire to, to uh, take on a part of that area, 
whether it's before, during, or after this, the project timeline that we're financing, and want to commit to the city, uh, for example, their uh, design plan or, or want to implement something that we found favorable, uh, a development, for example, what are the, what are the mechanics of, of us being able to assign to them or have them take over a part of our, of, of the bond issuance in exchange for them getting uh, a, a portion of the site, for example, that we're taking out of the floodplain. Does that make sense? Well, I don't think they would take over a, a portion of the bond issuance. Okay. okay? The, 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 this debt is gonna be out there. Now, what you're talking about is, is a development that would occur within this, within, this, within this project area, right? And And assuming there was no public assistance to what they we're doing right, so there will be no TIF or no, no. We have to assume that in your question. Um, that would be, and they would do that development. That would mean new money is coming into the city, right? right? Through through sales taxes or property taxes. Well, you could use that money to pay for your debt service if that's what you're what you're getting at. So in essence, it would be you would have more money coming in. So some of the money the city was planning to use to pay this debt service, they wouldn't, you wouldn't have to use now. Does that make sense? Is that Am I answering your question or not? Uh, you are, and okay. you did a great job. I appreciate that. Okay. I guess the curiosity was, is there a way for us to portion out or take a part of our indebtedness and sell that to another party or let them take it over? Um, not too different from an assumable loan. That's not the way the, uh, go yeah, ahead. I, yeah. We don't have the right vis-a-vis -vis our our creditors to substitute another pair. We do, however, have a right to enter into an agreement enforceable by us with the other party that said you will pay us X dollars that we will pay toward this debt if we, I see. If we choose and they choose to enter into that. Yeah. We, cannot, we cannot shift our responsibility to our lenders okay. for someone else to pay. Ultimately, we are the borrower, and, and the people are buying the debt because of our credit worthiness and all that. So we couldn't literally assign the debt. But what we can do is we can enter in an agreement with somebody to say, hey, we are going to, by contract, commit you to paying us a certain amount of money, which we're going to turn around and pay towards this debt. And then legally, they are obligated to pay to Effectively. us. Right. So okay. we become the straw man for the money. And that is absolutely doable, and, and I think. Well, and, and of course, the value of that depends on the credit worthiness right. of Correct. the other party. Right, right, right. And right. what security there is for that and right. what motivates them to do it. So okay. that's highly speculative. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> Alderman Lockmiller. Uh, Mr. Play. Yes, sir. We're at double-A minus rated city? How Actually, you're a double-A rated city. These certificates would be rated double-A minus. Okay. And what's that based on? How do they, what do they look at? I'm, I, I really appreciate you bringing this up, actually, because, uh, I, you know, it, it, you don't, maybe don't have perspective, and I don't mean that no, ba badly, but, but you don't deal with this stuff every day. So, so I, I'm just here to tell you that receiving a double-A rating, which, is a, which the city is, is a heck of an accomplishment. I, I don't have the, the percentage of, of cities throughout the United States that are in that category, but there are very few ahead of you, okay? Cities and counties. There, there aren't many. St. Louis County happens to be a AAA. Mm -hmm. The state of Missouri happens to be a AAA, okay? But there aren't many. If we took cities in St. Louis County, there, there will not be but maybe just a few that would have a higher rating than you. But your question was, what do they take into consideration? They look at everything. They look at, your, they look at all of your financial documents. They look at everything that's out there. They compare it. They have, they have models that they set up. And they want to see what your reserve policy is, how many reserves do you have, how do you contribute to your reserves, how do you deal with unexpected expenses. And I will tell you, we, we spent a lot of time talking to them, but uh, honestly, the mayor, Bola, Karen Shaw, the, the, the city finance director, spent a lot of time answering questions and, 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 and put them in a position where they, and they have no allegiance to Brentwood. I mean, they're an independent, think of it this way, they're an independent entity that rates this, rates these, 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 uh, these, uh, this debt and the city, and they come in and they take all those factors and they come up with a result. And uh, uh, it's always nerve, to be honest with you, it's always nerve-wracking for us 
because we want to see you get the highest rating you can. The higher the rating, the lower the interest rate. Sure. So, so, is there a typical range then? This interest when you go to market that you'll be looking at as an interest rate. Well, if we're a double A, I'll give you a, I'll give you a sense of what we think it'll be. Okay, but I mean honestly, you don't know until we get into the market. You, you really don't, and uh, I can't say there's other double A credits like Brentwood out there in the next couple of weeks, so I don't have perfect comparisons to do it. But what we do take, we take a, uh, it's called the Municipal Mar Market Data Index, and it's a compilation of bonds and certificates that are issued throughout the United States. And there's a scale for each year, okay? So based on that and based on our experience with Brentwood, here's what we think, just to give you a sense of the yields. We think the, the yields on your, keep in mind we've got 2019 through 2043, right? That's, 20, that's the 25 years. So I'll just give you the quick range. I won't read every year. But we think the yield in the earliest year will be somewhere around 170. We have 168. I'm just rounding to 170. And then the longest the longest year, 2043, we expect it's going to be somewhere around 380. That would be the yield, okay? So those are good rates. I mean, interest rates are going up. I don't mean ne this week or next week, but, but in the coming weeks, in the coming months, the interest rates are going up. So I'd like to think we're getting in at a good time, you know, ahead before that, before that happens. And Jim, isn't the quality of the mayor and the board of aldermen considered? <laughs> 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 it's very extensive, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> I actually I went through one of these back in ninety eight, ninety nine, and and I got to tell you that the process has changed somewhat. Mm -hmm. uh, they were much more um, in depth than they were back in ninety nine. Mm -hmm. yep. Alderman Wagey. So <clears throat> what will our, this is maybe the bull or you, Mayor Thornton, but what, what will our general fund balance look like in the future? You know, we, we've been shooting for, um, you know, $5 million or, you know, 50% of our, our general fund reserve. What is our basic plan for the general fund balance going forward? Are we we gonna anticipated that question. <laughs> Karen Shaw. Because I hear our AA rating is continuing. Actually, it, it looks great. So as we were talking about this afternoon, um, this is going to come from the, the, the uh, payment, debt service payment, the additional debt service will come from the capital improvement fund. Based on some assumptions like the Ways and Means Committee is, it, you're on that committee I think too, uh, is, is looking at equipment purchases and, and vehicle purchases and what's coming up in the future and whatever and whether or not we truly need to replace it. Based on those type of assumptions and uh, the quick analysis that I did this afternoon, we don't see us rating too much into the uh, general fund for the, for the capital improvement fund to, to take this over. For example, in 19, Keep in mind, last year, I think in 17, we moved 622,000 into the capital fund for streets and that. Um, we see in, in 19 moving about 460,000, and then in 20, 301,000. And, and from there being, that, being stable, keeping all else the same as far as sales tax in the general fund. Um, and that would keep it right at the capital improvement fund spending what it's bringing in and paying off this debt. It wouldn't stop the, uh, not the street projects, not the big projects, but the streets and sidewalks that Dan has money in that he still does, we need that. Um, it, we kept in the computers and all that. For the most part, everything stayed the same, but, but the capital improvement fund would be what would be taking this debt on, this additional debt. So, so the general fund fund balance um, for year ending 2017, we have it at 45.07. And last year was when we amended that fund policy, um, fund balance policy to 50%. That's the reserve. Th that's the reserve. So adopt a 2018 um, budget, we have that. So this is the last year that we will transfer money to capital to complete the streets. We have that at 40.78%. And then in 19 and 20, we see it going back up. So it will take at least 
um, maybe five years before we actually reach, if everything stays the same, before we reach the 50% um, target that's in the fund balance policy. What are the policy. actual dollar projected figures? Um, so for 18, it's 4.9. Um, in 19, it's still 4.9, and then in 2020, it becomes 5, 5 million. So it would not be our plan to raid that reserve, basically. That, would that be is the correct. Plan. The general not. fund. Okay. And we're bringing two ways and means um, when next we meet. So one of the comp I had a conversation with one of the credit analysts, and the feedback he gave was that we need to tighten that policy so that if the city does decide to raid it, we say specifically within what time frame we want to restore it. So that's something Which our policy does somewhat address and that when we do that, we, we need to have a, uh, a written plan in place as right. to so how. We don't necessarily say, as he said, when or how long, right. but we say how we're going to do it. Right. That would be what we would need in place if we rated the general fund. But those percentage benchmarks are pretty low. They're at 15 percent, aren't they? For uh, general? For what you're talking about, having the written plan. It was 10 percent. 10 percent. Yes. Right. And yes. we're at 40. Yeah. Right. Okay. That's but correct. 50 is the target. 50 right. is the target. Right. Right. Okay. Right. But, but I think at the time when that was being mentioned, it goes to the budget amendment we're doing tonight because we were, it was so close to 15. Right. They felt like there should have been something that. Um, they brought that to our attention correct. when we met with them on the advance for funding last year. Could we so that was why, that on a text basis. Exactly. Right. The board asked us to But, do but the they weren't amendment. aware of the budget amendment that's coming before you tonight <clears throat> to, to, to restore that back to the general fund. And let me just speak to this point generally, because I think it's important. And, and one of the reasons that I think this is a good idea and that we should proceed with it is, is by borrowing this money, we are borrowing all the funds necessary to move well down the road on this project, right? Uh, I had Karen pull some receipts from the Manchester Renewal Project for the last fiscal year, 2017. We spent about $725,000 out of current, current money on this project, okay? Um, you know, we obviously can't afford to continue doing that, right? But if we have a large sum of money available to us to do that, then we don't have to continue to raid our current income, which gives us the position to rebuild those over time. And, and so, again, I think if you look at the structure of the debt, the notch is there specifically because we did not want to go raiding the reserve funds, right? We wanted to put ourselves in a position to feel fairly comfortable that the reserves would still be there and then have the debt go up when our income goes up or, and, and, and to continue to add to those reserve funds as we go. So I think, you know, uh, while this is a fairly big obligation, it's also a prudent way to take on uh, a, a project of this size because it allows us to do it without going down to the wire. Right. So, but, but the additional $400,000 of debt service that's anticipated between year 2022 and 2023, we don't have any articulated plans at this point for how to, how to come up with that additional $400,000. Other we than do. the fact that the TIFs will roll by then. Yeah. The, the TIFs at Meridian and the TIFs at uh, Hamley yeah. Station. Correct. Okay. Okay. One more question. Sure. Thank you. This might be a couple questions. So. And maybe this is kind of a certificate of participation 101, but um, <laughs> how are we able to borrow $43 million without going to the taxpayers for approval to do this? Well, uh, why don't I let some of the I legal think, people talk yeah. to that one? <laughs> <laughs> My name's Eric Creech with Gilmore and Bell. Uh, it's a very appropriate question for the topic. So what certificates of participation are is they are considered to be an annual appropriation debt. So every year, you as a city have to appropriate to make the lease payments under the lease. Because you are not exceeding in any year your receipts that you are bringing in, it is not considered indebtedness under the Constitution of the state of Missouri, and therefore you do not have to have voter approval. You only have to have voter approval for actual indebtedness, which exceeds your annual income. So. For that reason, it's not. So any year, and this goes to a question I believe uh, Alderman Dimmitt asked in his email, is these are not annually renewable leases. I mean, they, they, you have to physically appropriate every year in your budget to make the annual payment. And then upon that appropriation, you have then renewed the lease. But you can decide in year two, never mind, we're not going to appropriate, 
and they can't come back on you for the forty-two million dollars. Now, there's all sorts of other <laughs> issues that uh, <laughs> they, they, they do can't not necessarily your want firehouse, to get into. and they can't destroy you your credit. The, <laughs> you lose the firehouse. You uh, will lose the double A uh, rating. Yeah, you'll lose it, likely lose access to the public markets. Your mayor might lose the a foreseeable fit future. <laughs> there's a lot of uh, yeah. impact that goes to that, but. Legally speaking, it is a non-recourse debt to the city in that they cannot come back to you for the full 42,935. It's only what you appropriate every year. So for that reason, uh, that's kind of a long-winded answer, uh, but as you can see by the stacks of papers in front of you, it's probably <laughs> you figured that's what you're going to get. But that's why it's, it doesn't have to go to the voters is because it's annual appropriation. And the actual mechanics of this, I mean, in gross simplification is that we are basically, you know, renting out you know i'm looking at the schedule one which has some properties listed are those the total properties and are those the firehouse in the city hall i mean we're basically it's just temporarily the selling it's just, city the just the firehouse just, just the, the firehouse, firehouse. Okay. we're just so leasing out the firehouse yeah. so what you have, what you have done is in in december there was a document called a base lease and that was you leased the firehouse to umb bank as trustee for a term of years which goes out to 2065 i believe so they have the possessory right to the firehouse through 2065. They in turn turn around and lease that back to you so you can continue to use it on the annual basis. And it's that, those lease payments that are the security for the certificate. So it's a lease, lease back transaction. Rent to own. Rent to own. But at the end, you never lose fee simple title of the firehouse. You just lose access to it if you should not until 2065. But at the end of 2065, you get it back. Um, whether or not the certificates participation were paid off or not. Now, if the lease is paid off before 2065, then the base lease goes away and you get it back mm -hmm. at that point in time. But the firehouse isn't worth $43 million. It is not. Uh, that is correct. It is now. And, uh, there, is, uh, <laughs> there are several. Uh, 44. <laughs> and that goes to uh, I mean, awesome. Jim's ability to market the, uh, the certificates of participation and allowing it. Uh, people to be comfortable. They know that you've got a firehouse. They know you've got these projects that are out there. Um, sometimes we have to have collateral that's worth the amount of the certificate. Sometimes we don't. Uh, just kind of depends on the transaction. On this one, uh, we don't. And so you've got a firehouse that's worth 7.8 million, roughly, according to your insured value, I believe. And we're all in with the 17 and the 18 certificates, you're looking at $48 million worth of borrowing. Could I, could I ask you, is it in fact the criticality of that security which inspires buyers that we will repay the debt? Most people find the fact that it's uh, an essential service of the city to, uh, you know, if, if you have a firehouse, if you have city hall, if you have a police station, yeah. something like that. If you were just talking about uh, vacant parkland, um, people might not be as excited about that because you could easily or more easily walk away from that. It's a little tougher to walk away from a firehouse. Okay. So it's, uh, not, it's not just the value of the security. Right. It's the critical importance of the security. Yeah. Okay. And Thank you'll you. notice that uh, as well in the rating report. I'm sure they referenced the fact that it's an essential government purpose facility uh, that's serving as the collateral as well. Okay. Thanks for the clarification. We are considering leasing out rooms in the firehouse on a short-term basis <laughs> to put a little extra money into the coffers uh, in order to, you know. We can bump 64. Get three beds in each room And if you go on, uh, well, anyway, don't say it. Maybe we shouldn't get into that right now. Uh, any further questions? Alderman Leahy. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, I got a number of questions. and. To work with if I may let's take them one at a time and see if we get through um, mr. Leahy if I may ask you because I think you've got the the best arrangement and I'm gonna come through the chair that's right if we work through this bond issuance what is the cost of, to the city for doing the bond issuance in the way of what do we owe mr. Leahy's group for doing all this work well I doubt anybody at Stiefel's gonna go hungry but, but Mr. Leahy, can you address the fees? Y yes, sir. Um, the, the, our fee, the underwriter's discount, is 1.25%. The other costs are things like bond counsel, 
underwriters council to draft the documents, trustee fees. There's no, typically, you know, with a lot of the TIFs that you've done, there's been revenue projection reports uh, that, that development strategies has worked on. There isn't, there isn't such a thing here because we have a history of what the revenues are. Those things add up to an, another, we're estimating about $215,000. So 215000 plus the 1.25%. Yes, sir. Okay, so I'm fair. Let's roll a simple number of $250,000 by the time we finish all the paperwork to get bonds going? No. No, no. I'm going to be less. No, it would be about $750,000. 750000 yes, Okay. Um, through the chair again, but I think uh, Ms. Oconde might be able to help us. When we ran the online sales tax distribution through the state. I believe the state cost us $10,000 to do that election. That's about right. So we spent 10,000 there, we're spending about 700,000 if we do the bonds. Am I correct, Mr. Leahy, if I can through the, through the chair, Mayor? Mm -hmm. If we do this action, we are hopefully to generate a $43 million bond so that we at least have some revenue going through. But our potential project for the entire Manchester Road corridor is lined out in these three parts is about 72 million. It's actually a bit higher. I think it's like 76, Craig? Yeah, 75 and a half. Okay. 75 and a half. So we still have about $32 million that we still have to come up with somewhere. Well, so let me, let, you were correct, but let me say this about that. So okay. if you recall, the 75 and a half was a plus or minus 20% estimate. Okay. Right? So, and um, that also did not take into account the $4.1 million we've already been given as a grant. Yes. Right? That also did not take into account any of the commitment that GRG had made or has made and will hopefully make in the future. Uh, so, so, yes, I mean, you're absolutely right. Let's say there we is have a 30, 30 million. There's a $30 million gap. Gap that we have but to, to work with. That gap now. is plus or minus... 20% of 75 million. All right. Now, that 30 million during our workshop activities, we were looking at the potential of doing an economic sales tax. Correct. If we went down that avenue, we do or would need a vote of the citizens of Brentwood to approve us to go down that route? Correct. If we were to implement an economic development sales tax, as we discussed, it would require a majority vote of the Brentwood tax, Brentwood voters to an in. To, to collect that tax, All to right. authorize that tax. If we go down this route and do the bonds and everything, we then have to have a <coughs> sit down with our budget and start looking at from 2024 through 2043, 45, depending on where we pay out, what we would be spending and how we would accumulate money to be able to pay off the $3.2 million indebtedness over those years. Yes. So we would have to work through some of the, those issues to work it. It is my understanding of the project and where we're headed with it. I'm in agreement with you that it needs to get done. It's the only way to develop that corridor. If we develop the corridor, we bring in hopefully a potential new corridor of revenue of sales tax, yep. which improves and allows the city to form and provide services. And we don't have to go to the voters to add a property tax. So there's a benefit to the city to get this done. My concern and what I have here is the way we're approaching it. I think it is in the best interest of this board and the city of Brentwood that before we get so far pregnant to go down, that we actually go to the voters and ask them if this project and the economic sales tax is justifiably a high enough of a priority on their end that we indebt the city to go the long term. We spend the $10,000 to do an election to find out yay or nay, let's go down that route. If it is acceptable to them, then you can go look at spending a $750,000 to get your borrow money to keep moving, but we have a closer way of covering the full gross value. Mr. Mayor, point of order. I'm. Yes, what's your point? This is the first reading tonight? It is. These are questions by the alderman? I'm taking this as a prelude to a question. 
Thank you. I've been asking questions. Go ahead. Okay. So what I'm looking at is why and how is it in the best interest of the city that we go for a $43 million borrow, still coming up short in the long term without going through and covering the simpler question if the citizens of the Brentwood believe the project's worth enough to go ahead and allow us to start moving down with a sales tax and the borrowing to support it. Because if they vote down the sales tax after we've made the borrow, we still owe Mr. Leahy's group $750,000 to get everything back to him, but we can't prepay it for the first eight, maybe 10 years to work with, so we're gonna incur even that debt. I think it's cheaper and smarter if we put the one item in front of the other to go after, and I'm ending question because Mr. Plufka would like me to. If I delay, or if this board For the delays, record, I ruled against Mr. Plufka, you can go on. Oh, okay. okay. If we delay running into quickly borrowing the, 40, the bonds and borrowing the 43, what does that do to us if we come back a year from now to work through the indebtedness of borrowing and buy us the time to go to the elective? Let me just first say, is it okay, Mayor? Yeah, sure. Um, so let me just first tell you the schedule that we're mm -hmm. on, okay, and then I'll, I'll, I'll get to your question. But I think there needs to be an understanding of that. So our, so our, our hope and our, the plan is that, depending upon what happened tonight at this first reading, that we would print an offering document tomorrow. And if you remember, the offering document allows us to actually start marketing the certificates, mm -hmm. okay? And then we take the next two weeks to do that, and as Alderman Dimmitt asked earlier, on, on the April 16th, two weeks from today, we would actually price those certificates, and, we'd have, and you'd have the net proceeds, let's call it 39 million for your project, okay? And so you would have you would have expended in your comment you would have expended seven hundred fifty thousand that's true but you'd also you'd have thirty nine million dollars towards your project mm -hmm. okay your question though is if we if we don't do that we delay this the city decides to delay this and and there the mayor and others would, should should address this but I just want to comment from my from my perspective so you would know the seven hundred fifty thousand that's for sure we we're not we're only compensated when we deliver the final result okay, okay. so you don't owe us anything. Um, I can't speak they're, for they're the other. They're sort of consultant. like uh, Brown and Crouppen. No, <laughs> no fee unless you win. Yeah. I haven't often been compared. To <laughs> but, but, I'm but, a lawyer. I meant that in a perfectly <laughs> favorable way. <laughs> but um, but here's the thing. You and I'm not trying to. Mm -hmm. I'm not trying to just persuade you one way or the other. Okay, I'm really not. But waiting a year, as you as you suggested, mm -hmm. is one thing we can almost rest assured as interest rates are going to go up okay I mean, I'm, I'm telling you interest rates are going to go up they're start they've started to go up so they're they're higher now than they were a couple of months ago when we did the refunding in in late 2017 they're higher mm -hmm. the interest rates have gone up they're going to continue to go up the fed has already announced they're they're increasing the rates they just did it right so i borrow instead of the 43 million i borrow 20 uh, 38 million you get something if you want to keep to the uh, uh, Alderman, level. Alderman's, he, he, yeah, that, that sheet that he asked before. Mm -hmm. um, we you want to keep the debt at 2.8 and then and then notch it up to 3.2. Interest rates are going to be higher, so you're not going to get 39 million. You're going to get something less than that. Okay. Okay. Now and maybe that's not. Maybe you don't care. I'm just saying what, that would be I, the result. I do care. Okay. My intent is, I am having trouble with the city going into a deep indebtedness and still coming up with short money in the way of I can't fund the whole project. So let, let me address the rest of that because I'll, I'll tell you why I think it's a good idea. I'll listen. And, and by the way, there's no right answer to your question. I mean, your, your question is a good one. Um, and it, it's a matter of opinion. So let me mm -hmm. give you my opinion as to why this is a good idea. Uh, the, the first thing I would say is exactly what Jim said. It's, <laughs> it, it is a very good time to borrow and that time is passing. And you know, if it'll come around again, who knows? I mean, no, if I had a crystal ball, I'd tell you, uh, but I don't. Uh, what I do know is the interest rates on a historical basis are very favorable right now and allows us to get into this debt at a, at a much more reasonable price than we might have expected any time in the near future. The second thing is, is that um, even if we imposed, if we took a economic development sales tax to the voters, mm -hmm. the expected revenue from that tax per year is $3.2 million, okay? 
that is not sufficient to fund the entire project. No, it is not. Right. So even if we did that, we would, we would still be in a position to where we would have to fund some additional debt to cover the entire project, right? Yes. So there's nothing about what we're considering doing here that precludes us from going for an additional economic development sales tax down the road, right? Uh, so uh, the point is, is that, let's say we did what you were suggesting and went for an economic development sales tax vote in November, mm -hmm. right? Even if the taxpayers approved it, right, if we devoted that entire proceeds to debt retirement, we would still find ourselves with a gap of roughly 30-something million dollars, right? Because 3.2 million is going to buy you about 40 at today's rates. Mm -hmm. By November, who knows, Okay. <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. So we still find ourselves with a gap and, and no better position to address it than we are today. So my point is, why not act today when we have some things that we know are in our favor, right? The other thing is if we don't proceed with the project, and this again, you're talking pure opinion on my part, right? Okay. We have some what I will call momentum, right? We have got a project out to bid with engineering firms to look at our design plan and to really get into the nuts and bolts of this thing. We need to continue to make that progress if this project is to have any hope of coming in, you know, in any foreseeable time frame. Uh, the more we learn, right, the more we can get a definite, uh, look, 72, 75 million plus or minus 20 is not comforting to me, <laughs> <laughs> right? It's not comforting to anybody up here, but the problem is, is without spending money and without proceeding with the project, we won't get a better answer, right? We, we will only get plus or minus 20 until we go and we start taking surveys and putting shovels in the ground and taking tests and doing soil samples and all of those types of things. And, and you know, as our design gets more and more refined, uh, you know, Brandon, feel free to jump in as an engineer on this one. As the design gets more and more refined, the costs of the project will get more and more certain, right? Right up into the point where, hey, when we make that last decision, whatever it happens to be, Right, we, we will have a we will have an idea of what the total cost. But the opinion between you and I as differing is whether the citizens of the city of Brentwood yeah. would agree that this is such a right. high priority and, to justify the. And I will debt. answer that one too. And that that is also a matter of opinion. I yeah. you know I don't I don't feel the need to put it to a vote. But here's why. Right, when I was campaigning in 2015, <laughs> I asked people what was important to them, without exception. The number one answer was Manchester Just Road. Just a road. Right? When I was attending all of our pre-sessions to, uh, to the development, the redevelopment of the long comprehensive plan, without exception, every session I attended, business, religious, residential, every one of them said Manchester Road. That makes me quite comfortable, right? And I'm not going to speak for anybody here, but I will speak for myself. That makes me quite comfortable that, that I am doing the right thing by the citizens of Brentwood. I'm also, and I will tell you this, I'm also done enough homework to be absolutely convinced that if we, the people in this room, do not solve that problem, it will not be solved. There is no magic federal ferry coming to spend money. There is no state ferry. There's no MSD people. There's, There's no lottery This is ticket. all a myth, <laughs> right? I've heard them all, right? The Corps of Engineers, the blah, 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 yeah. blah. I've heard them all. And it's all, pardon my French, it's all bullshit. If we don't do it, nobody will. Okay. So given those facts, I feel completely comfortable that what we are doing is the right thing for the city. Is it risky? Yes. I think it's the right thing to do, and I think the people will agree. Okay. In your response to my question, you pointed out that if we delay, we may end up seeing a higher interest rate to work with. Mr. Leahy, in the last 17 years that you and I have worked together back and forth for the city bonds and stuff, I believe that we have refinanced bonds five times now for all the different projects that we've been doing over the last 17 years. And each time that we refinanced those bonds, we were able to lower the interest rates that were out there. And right. yet it was always a good time to get in because we didn't want interest rates to go up and we looked for ways to drop it down. In your crystal ball, between now and 19, uh, 20 to 45, would you foresee that we would have that opportunity that 
we could look at refinancing this potential bond somewhere out down the road with the hope of looking for lower interest rates? That's a long, the, the answer is yes. That's it, a long period a of time. It's a possibility yes. to work with. Yeah. So by delaying and putting the potential of going for the economic sales tax to the voters for their permission and spend $10,000 for an election, because we honestly didn't expect the voters to tell us that the sales tax for uh, online sales would have saw the resistance that we did with it. I think spending the 10000 and doing a public election versus spending 750000 right now to do a bond indebtedness and still coming up short, I think we've got them in reverse. I think we should go to the voters first. Okay. All right, questions? One more, more question. questions. Can I, can I just ask clarification on your comment about the GRG commitment? Yeah. So the, the GRG made a commitment to us, and I believe it's coming in writing. I'm going to let Craig actually take this or one. Maybe He's a little closer. Maybe we can't talk about it yet. Or. It, well, how would you describe it, Craig? Come on up. I, I would describe it as a soft circle. Yeah, so Craig Schlitter with Navigate Building Solutions. So, um, yeah, so GRG and their council um, have agreed to make a commitment. They haven't given an exact amount of money. However, however we've heard unofficially it's roughly around $3 million. And um, the city should be getting a memo of understanding within the week from GRG and their council and their legal team. Um, and frankly, it could come tomorrow. Um, but they told us last week it would be within a week for the city of Brentwood to receive that. Awesome. Bo Bola and Craig and I went to the GRG board yes. of directors and we made a pitch to partner with them and we made a pitch to them to, to pony up some mm -hmm. cash for this project and they responded with, a, we believe, a commitment of three million. That's great. Yeah. And yeah, the city of Brentwood would get a memo of understanding within a week for that. Okay. So it's That's coming. good news. Yeah. We're averaging three and a half million every yeah, I, I come it, to. So we've, I've been, I've been waiting time. until we actually have the document in our hand. Okay. Yeah. You know me, I don't like the, you know. Yeah. All right, thanks. I'm not thanks gonna count the clear. chickens before they're actually in the barn. Alderman Kramer. Yes, Your Honor. If I could ask another quick question of Mr. Sure. Lehay. This is a technical question since that came onto the floor and I just wanna sew it up real quick if I could regarding yield. Yes. Sir. You mentioned 2019 to 2043. We we're looking at roughly 1.70 to 3.80. Yes, sir. Based upon the securitization of the firehouse, if we were to have, by some miracle, a larger amount of pledgeable assets or totally pledgeable assets for that amount, would the rate change that measurably? No, it's based on the rating primarily, the AA rating. So I don't think it's going to change the rating. Um, and. Uh, your, your city attorney and, and uh, Eric did a good job, of, I think, of, of addressing the question of the $7.8 million the fire facility you know, is, is, not, is not $43 million. But, but they did a great job of explaining that it's an essential facility. And so if you, if you got more collateral, it's, I don't think it's going to change. It's not going to change anything. Okay. Thank you so much. Yes. The, the usefulness of our fire station to UMB Bank is, is actually quite low. <laughs> and, and I don't think the fire sale price of the fire station to, to for example, Maplewood or somebody huh. would be all that great either. So uh, you, you might, look folks, I mean, there's no doubt about it, right? Doing it this way is a lot like going to the bank and getting what they call a personal loan. Mm. It's based on your credit rating and it's based on the financial strength of the city. Any more questions? All right. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all. Uh, let's see. We are at item 11B on the agenda, and that is bill number 6191. Mr. City Attorney, can we have the first reading by title only, please? Bill number 6191, first reading and ordinance amending certain sections of Chapter 400 in order to clarify the current zoning prohibition of short-term rental of dwelling units in the ABARMR residential zoning districts and the UD Urban Development Zoning District. Thank you, sir. Alderman Kramer, can we have a synopsis? Yes, Your Honor. Further information for 6191. That bill contains text amendments to continue prohibition of short-term rentals in the residential districts of urban development, urban development district, residential areas of the city of Brentwood. This is case 18-01. Short-term rentals are defined as rentals of dwelling units for typical periods of less than a month. Currently, our city's zoning code does not specifically define short-term rentals. However, since short-term rentals are not permitted by right and do not comply with the city's occupancy permit program, short-term rentals operations have been prohibited. 
our Public Works Committee requested the Planning and Development Department staff propose text amendments to Chapter 400, our zoning ordinance, to clarify the current prohibition of the operation of short-term rentals in our city. New definitions are proposed for short-term rentals, transient guests, and vacation rentals, which would be added to the definition section. The home occupation provisions would be amended to prohibit short-term rentals, boarding houses, bed and breakfast, hotels, and similar facilities. The district regulations for each residential zoning district and the UD district would be amended to clarify that residential, quote unquote, use does not include short-term residential use by transient guests, for example, short-term rentals. Finally, additional language concerning occupancy permits would be added to clarify that short-term rentals cannot qualify for an occupancy permit. At their March 14th Planning and Zoning Commission meeting, the Commission at that time voted three in favor, four opposed to the bill prohibiting short-term rentals. The bill prohibiting short-term rentals moves forward to the Board of Aldermen, thus with consideration with an unfavorable recommendation to approve from the Commission all the language found in Bill Number 6191. All right, thank you. Uh, before we start uh, questions on this, and we're going to ask uh, uh, Director of Planning and Zoning Kirkemeyer to come up and, and make give us some information, I just want to remind the board that uh, the unfavorable recommendation from Planning and Zoning is not binding. Uh, it requires a majority board vote on this text amendment to either pass or not pass it. So no change in the voting or anything like that. Uh, <coughs> Dr. Kirkemeyer, come on up. Thank you. Good evening. So I think the synopsis probably did a good job, um, efficient job, of explaining exactly what the prohibition would actually entail and how it came about. So about the only thing I, I want to add, because it was brought up in public comments this evening, was in regard to the state legislation. And I think just to clarify on that just briefly, is that I'm, I know of five different bills that have been entered into the state legislature, either through the House or the Senate. And all of those have died in committee. There is a current one that is under consideration for the spring legislature. And I don't know if they'll address it in the spring session or what may happen. Um, currently, though, the, the <coughs> law would be for um, cities to regulate short-term rentals. And what it does say, actually, if something like this would pass the way the bill is written right now, is that after, if again, if it was adopted by August of 2018, if, uh, if it was passed, then there couldn't be any cities that could actually pass ordinances anymore that prohibit short-term rentals. And by August of 2019, if you had a prohibition that was on the books, then no longer after August 2019 could you enforce your ordinance prohibiting short-term rentals. The only thing, though, I would like to say again is I'm going to stress that there's been five bills out there over the last six years that either try to regulate them or even impose, like, tax regulations. So I, again, it, it's anybody's guess, but I'm not really thinking that anything's going to come out of the state law in terms of this. But regardless, I just wanted to let you know a little bit more of the background of you, that. You left your crystal answer. ball at home as well? I did. I yeah. know the crystal ball's been we asked We've got to get better people in here. Times, Everybody, yeah. Nobody has a clear view of the future. <laughs> I don't get it. Alderman Wege. So this is, um, <clears throat> I mean, this bill prohibits, but it's really a clarification of what we believe the current code says, correct? This is not a change from what, what it is right now. Right. Um, our position, city's position, staff's position would not be changing just with this ordinance. It's just for clarification. And um, again, it just, uh, right now, our current ordinance uh, certainly doesn't permit short-term rentals, and they cannot comply with our occupancy permit program. So therefore, we have taken the stance that they um, are not prohibited or not legal right now. So, and I guess to give a little bit of background too, because there was a statement that there are probably five or six possible short-term rentals in Brentwood. But again, that was one of the things that we were advised by um, attorneys is to make these clarifications in the code before we would really do enforcement, so. Yeah, I, I would describe this as a, uh, a clarification of the status quo. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. So, I mean, I know, I know P and Z is talking about, you know, ways to allow it. If we pass this ordinance, does that prevent that 
conversation from continuing because that would be an, an adoption of a new policy that would potentially come to this board, correct? So any elected appointed officials can actually initiate text amendments. So um, last fall, early winter, when the Public Works Committee, which is where the prohibition for the clarification started, that was certainly within the right of the committee to do that. It's also within the right of the PNZ to initiate text amendments as well. So this one just needs to march through with the schedule that it's on. And then um, regardless of really the outcome on, on the vote of this, the PNZ, if it makes it out of the commission to somehow create regulations for short-term rentals, that could come up in front of the board as well. Okay. I'll actually add to that because I've had conversations with Chairman Daming. He, he has not made any attempt to discourage regulation discussion in that this board has not acted on. I, I think if this board would act and adopt the ordinance to clarify the status quo, I think he may then take a different position with respect to, they could certainly do it, but it might seem a lot more like a waste of time if the discussion of regulation might seem like a waste of time if this board votes to clarify the status quo. Correct. Wow, that's a reach. Okay. Well, I, you know, I, th those are have been our discussions. Okay. Well, if the board votes to clarify that we're not allowing them, then, you know, but maybe the interpretation should be, hey, send us some good regulations and we'll reconsider. Yeah. What about uh, so, Lisa? I know. What about enforcement? So, you know, we've been all looking on Airbnb and, and looking for things. So, I mean. How would we do that if, well, if this is clarified? I, Airbnb, Airbnb and all the other sites do not make it easy. Yeah. So, um, you know, it's an industry, granted, it's, it's growing in popularity, um, but still, they never advertise by addresses. Mm -hmm. So obviously, it's, it's, it's kind of hard to document these, but, um, you know, it's, one, it's gonna be one of those situations where I think again, if um, it's going to probably be the neighbors that are closest in proximity to any short term rentals that we're going to hear from. And then um, when we hear that, we've got ways certainly that we will be able to enforce that. So, um, the, and so actually, with the, the sum of the rentals that we have uh, reports on that are short term rentals, we have already begun documenting there. So, there are means to be able to do that. Okay, and then one, one more question, and maybe you can answer this, but you know, we, we talked about Airbnb and these kind of established websites that have um, you know, kind of a self-controlling, self-policing feature of the rating system and everything, but, but and maybe this is too hypothetical, but really nothing would prevent somebody from putting a Craigslist out ad for a short-term rental for a couple of days. I mean, that would, that would all fall into this kind of bucket of short-term rentals, correct? It Cage. would if, uh, if, again, the regulations just as presented would be passed because now we have definitions for short-term rentals, um, okay. transient. So those things are defined by a period of time. So. Okay, thank you. Father Maplefka. Thank, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, with regard to your memo, there were seven people present at the Planning and Zoning Commission meeting where they took up this vote. How big is that full committee? How many? How many oh, on the P and Z committee? right now, plans yes. only. There are 14 members. Okay. So we well, have I'm sorry. Actually, there's 13 because there was a resignation a just about six weeks ago. Right. He moved, he moved out of town, I think. Right. So there are 13 members. Seven were there for the vote. Four voted um, against this clarification prohibition. Three voted in favor of it. Correct. So then you had a site plan review type meeting at the end of this last month, just a few days ago. There were different, there were people who were at that meeting on the commission who were not present for the vote, right? Correct. So did, did anybody, mm -hmm. did you or did anybody else, did Chairman Daming or anybody take an informal poll of the folks who weren't, a, weren't there to vote, it, it, it was spring break, but who weren't there to vote on this thing, did they get any sense of what those other members were inclined to want to do? H had they been present to vote? No, not at this meeting. Okay. Chairman Daming um, shared with me that he, it was his sense that if the full Planning and Zoning Commission had been seated, yeah. that the measure would have received a favorable recommendation. Okay, this measure that's before Correct. us now. And then, the, and again, you. that's that's thank hearsay. You. No, no, I understand. But it, and it's based on a. But well, that I, was his sense. And I and my only my, my last question is you you had 
come up with this list and I appreciate all the work that you did going to other communities and finding out what they had done with this question you, you indicate not regulating is the pair how old is that information do you know uh, current because we had sent it out to my planners list and the city administrators list so within the last uh, couple months Okay, well, I, I just happen to, I mean, I, I know the city attorney for the city of De Pere, and I, I think it's on their agenda this month, actually. Okay, that could be. So, so I, didn't, I didn't know if you'd had any sense or any conversations with your counterpart in De Pere. And in fact, since that memo was uh, put together, there, I think, was a total of six or seven communities right. that are basically in the same stance that we're at. That, right. You know, they're just... Thinking about not, it. Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> Father McDermott. Mr. Chairman, Lisa. I just need some help on understanding how this worked, how we got to this point procedurally. My recollection is it came out of Public Works unanimously to instruct staff to put together ordinances that would prohibit short-term rentals. And because it deals with zoning, it has to go through P and Z. But, and here's my problem, is with a unanimous directive from the Public Works Committee to get this ordinance, to get the proper language in place, it seems to me that planning and zoning uh, didn't really follow that directive. Because shouldn't they have just looked at the language and said, yes, this does meet that directive, the language that's being proposed by staff to prohibit these short-term rentals. And instead, they came up with, which they have the right to do, this, this alternative version that will probably come in front of this board uh, you know, in a month or so. So that's, that's where I'm kind of confused. It seems to me this, this kind of falls into the category of whether to subdivide a lot. You know, if it meets these requirements, you go ahead and planning and zoning signs off on it. They get a director from staff. The committee wants to see this be uh, prohibited. Let's get the language in place. Here's our language. Does it satisfy that goal? Well, I, I do think, again, um, when this ordinance that's before you tonight was prepared, they've looked at it, and um, I, I know they sensed that it would be effective in prohibiting short-term rentals, so it meets that objective. And then secondly, though, it still would be their responsibility to either still recommend a text amendment or not, just like any applications that they have the responsibility to review and I do feel like they um, I do feel like they met all their obligations and so forth because um, now these two ordinances are, are somewhat on a different path you know timing wise and and I think that's it is kind of unfortunate because I think it's kind of confused the public but nevertheless the vote was taken there was a quorum that was available at that meeting on March 14th and so um, they made a motion it seconded and then they voted on it, and then it still meant that this uh, prohibition would still come before you this evening. So it didn't it didn't stop that process. So, you know, I, I, well, I look. What, what, I was unable to attend the, the meeting when the vote took, when the vote took place. What was your understanding as for the basis for their um, their vote to not recommend approval of the ordinance that's in front of us, sixty one ninety one? Well. Uh, I, uh, the draft of the minutes has been done. It's just that they haven't been approved yet and would not be approved to the April meeting. So, again, I would I would just have to kind of go on what my recollection is of the the meeting. But the ones that were there, it just it's a, a 13 member board, so that could obviously be 13 different opinions. And I do think it was probably just the composition of who was at that meeting that that night that. Um, Collectively, they, they've had good experiences at these types of short-term rentals. Um, it's what they're accustomed to when they travel. And they pointed out advantages for the short-term rental market. Um, but that being said, there were people there, definitely residents, as well as the other uh, members of the board that certainly still had objections of short-term rentals. And a lot of them, was I think it's a little bit of the NIMBY thing, not in my backyard. I, I definitely could say that I saw more of like, yeah, I like to do that when I leave town, but yeah, I'm not sure if I want it next door to me. So I don't you know, want to influence the vote in any way, but I would say that I picked up on that quite frequently with those that reviewed these proposals. Well, that, and that's where I'm struggling. I, I don't understand the benefit to permitting 
these operating in our residential uh, zones. So I'm just wondering, what were, what was a reason given f the benefit to the city or the benefit to the residents to allowing these to operate? Sure. Um, so I do have the, uh, the minutes here. Um, and again, these are not ones that have been approved, but some of the comments made were um, short-term rentals could show the diversity of the Brentwood community. Um, again, the idea that the state at some point are going to adopt these regulations for communities to follow, let's get ahead of the curve, that um, visitors that come to the community uh, we'll spend money at local businesses. It's a way to promote and showcase the community, showcase the neighborhoods even, was expressed. Uh, I think, again, some of them commented that if there was just regulations, that, again, it would be a more positive experience for the person visiting and for the community. So those are just some of the comments that were okay. made but most of it was just contributing still to the local economy um, I guess the last comment that I'll make was also that they are more sensitive and kind of environmentally friendly sharing homes and residents versus hotels and so okay. other block Miller uh, Lisa when's their next meeting their next meeting will be Wednesday, April 11th. So we would have time in our next packet at our next meeting to have all those minutes provided if they approve mm -hmm. those at that meeting? Yes, for the 16th, correct. So we can have them? Mm -hmm. Okay. And also, when somebody brings a petition like that, is there a time limit on when PNZ has to act upon it? So that There is. I want to, uh, maybe I might need to ask Mr. O'Keefe this, but I believe it's like 70 days. I believe it's 70 days after 75. the application. Yeah. 75. So at that yeah, point, yeah. Otherwise, what happens is the um, petition, whatever nature of it is, issue. goes through, but it goes through with uh, a favorable recommendation of the commission. Okay. Thanks. Any further questions? Alderman Kramer. Yes, Your Honor. Uh, Madam City Administrator, this might be one you could handle if or at least if you happen to know this topic came up several times the conversations and the reviews that I heard uh, when the subject of hotels came up in comparison or contrast does this the city has a hotel tax currently we do not we do not and some of the other cities nearby that do have this regulation in place do or don't have hotel taxes I don't know if that has ever been looked at or why we haven't been able, why we have <coughs> a hotel tax. We're actually prohibited. Right. State law now prohibits municipalities in St. Louis County from impose, imposing a lodging tax. It did not until about three years ago. I, I know of one city that has it, but most cities do not. And if I'm not mistaken, that statute provides that if you had one in place prior to the statute, that was fine. But huh. <laughs> if you didn't, then you missed the boat. Interesting. Yes. And then the other question was, I think there was a reference tonight from one of our uh, residents about a revised statute of the state of Missouri 315. Is the 31 days language from that? Where do we get the 31 days? Uh, chapter 315 of the Missouri statutes governs hotels and lodging facilities and the state regulations pertaining to them. Uh, they do define uh, a hotel and transient guests uh, as those who occupy a premises for 30 days or less. Okay. And that language was taken from, that concept was imported into this regulation. Okay. Thank you, Ron. Any further questions? And that definition also applies for purposes of taxation. The hotel taxes right. are applicable ah. to transient guests. Right. Yeah. Okay. Same, same deal, yeah. All right. No further questions. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to uh, item number 12 on our agenda, if I'm not mistaken.
Uh, we don't have any item number 12s on our agenda. Let's go to items 14 would be the next thing. Um, first up is 14A, resolution 1089. Uh, Alderman Kramer, do you have a synopsis? I do, Your Honor. Resolution 1089 speaks to destruction of inactive records. It's the recommended guideline of the Missouri Secretary of State to formally approve the disposition of local government records at the Board of Aldermen level per the Secretary of State's local records retention schedules guidelines, quote, the disposition of records should be recorded in a document such as the minutes of the City Council or other legally <laughs> constituted authorities that have permanent records statuses, unquote. The staff has reviewed existing records and confirmed that the records listed in Exhibit A are materials that meet the retention schedule set forth by our Missouri Secretary of State that these records are no longer needed by staff. Staff has also verified that this list does not contain any records that would be considered of any historical nature. The recommendations for the Board of Aldermen to uh, the di approve the disposition of the records listed in Exhibit A. Our Ways and Means Committee unanimously approved the recommendation and the recommendation to the full board this evening from their March 14, 2018 meeting. This is Resolution 1089. I'd entertain a motion to adopt Resolution 1089. So moved. Second. Second. Been moved and seconded that the board adopt Resolution Number 1089. Is there any discussion? Other one, Leahy. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, in looking through the record list, they have on the very little, second to last page, I think it is, they're not numbered. I'm looking at the police department record for destruction. There are 24 boxes, of which five boxes have police records and stuff that go up to 2016. Since I'm not sure what's in the records, my question is, I know we have unsolved cases and stuff from 2016 and 2015 and 2017. I'm assuming somebody has sorted through these to verify that none of this information would affect the potential solving or closing a case. I don't believe any of the records here pertaining to any existing case that has not been solved. Uh, Major McIntyre uh, worked on this project reviewed all the records in compliance with the um, re record retention schedule. Um, he recommends that we're in compliance with that. That's why we took it to Ways and Means and formally to the Board of Aldermen tonight. Thank you. And if you approve this, their cleanup ratio jumps. <laughs> 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 the case closure rate is well, going to skyrocket. Well, uh, fantastic. Yeah, yeah. Clear. Uh, any further does uh, Alderman Lockmiller? Madam City Administrator, the when we look at the drawings under planning and development, there's some drawings and they go back to the 30s. <laughs> None of that was historical. Yeah. Well, um, if you Not recall, that I was around or anything. we had the Historical Society building uh, next door in Rosalie. Yeah. And for some odd reason, the city decided to use the basement of that building as storage. Mm -hmm. Damp, wet, okay. spiders, you name it. Not legible. Damage beyond. Yeah. Thank you. Further discussion? Are we ready for a vote? No, oh. I'd just uh, like to make a comment. Alderman O'Brien. I am impressed with the amount of detail that would have gone into doing this. Pages and pages of what lists like boxes full of papers does not sound like a lot of fun. It was but not. But I think it is commendable of the city <laughs> to clean it up, and kudos to you for doing it. Thank you to the department directors. They worked on it for the past six to nine months. <laughs> All right, uh, all in favor of the adoption of Resolution 1089, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? By a vote of unanimous, eight to zero, Resolution 1089 is adopted. Item 11B, or sorry, 14B on the agenda is Resolution 1091. Alderman Kramer, can we have a synopsis, please? Surely, Your Honor, Resolution 1091, the fiscal 2018 budget amendment is the topic and the Budget Amendment Fund Transfer Explanation, 2018 Budget Amendment Reverse General Fund Transfer Table, and the 2018 Budget Amendment Summary of All Funds. The resolution adopts the Fiscal Year 2018 Budget Amendment. Within the Fiscal Year 2018 Approved Budget is a large transfer made up of the fund balance from the General Fund Unassigned Reserves. This money was budgeted to be moved into the Stormwater and Park Improvements Fund in order to fund the Manchester Renewal Project, line item 50.00.00.6482. 
with the Board of Aldermen considering the issuance of the 2018 Certificates of Participation, COPs, there would be no need for this transfer now. To make the change, a budget amendment, amendment was submitted to the Ways and Means Committee at their March 20th meeting for consideration and approval. Based on their recommendation, the amendment would need to be presented to the full Board, the full board of Aldermen for their approval. The Ways and Means Committee unanimously hereby recommends the presentation to the Board of Aldermen tonight for consideration and approval. This is Resolution 1091. All right, thank you. I would uh, take a motion to adopt 1091. So moved. Second. It's been moved and seconded that the Board of Aldermen adopt Resolution 1091. Is there any discussion? Alderman Leahy. Your Honor, the way I read and understand this resolution, this pre, pre precludes that this board looks to go for the COPs, and thus I think we're again putting something ahead of where it should be. I think this should be held off till we determine whether the COP route is the best route to go right now versus I would like the board to seriously consider looking at fulfilling the full bu budget arrangement and potentially asking the voters for help in making this decision. I think it's right for the voters to do so, and thus undoing it right now without having that issue resolved, this may be too early to consider. Um, okay, so I'm torn between taking that as a motion to defer <laughs> or, or uh, as a question, so let it's, me. It's a question at this point, Your right. Honor. So, so let me try to respond to that question. So, the, the, I think the simple fact is is that either way, this transaction makes sense. Either we will go ahead and do the COP transaction and we'll proceed with this project, or we will not go ahead with the COP transaction and we will not proceed with this project. If we don't proceed with this project, I don't think that anybody in this room is going to be in favor of running down our 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 fund balances i mean i you know i i, I think at this point it's um you know it was done as a, it was done as a stopgap measure anyway mm -hmm. the, the budgeting so i think at this point i think people are clarified enough on kind of where we're at to make a decision one way or the other so in my opinion and again maybe just opinion uh you know, we need to do this regardless because we have a lot more information than we had when we were preparing the budget. And based on that information, we're either going to move forward with the COP or we're not. And either way, we need to put these transactions back to the way they were. Just my two cents. For the questions, discussion? All, right. All in favor of the adoption of Resolution 1091, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Opposed. By a vote of seven to one, resolution 1091 is adopted. Alderman Leahy was opposed. Uh, counts against the city. Alderman Dimmitt, the warrant list, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I've had an opportunity to go over the warrant list with uh, staff, and uh, accordingly, I would make a recommendation to approve that the warrant list in the amount of $222,953.20. Second, Your Honor. Thank you. It's been moved and seconded that the board approved the warrant list in the amount of $222,953.20. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, we'll have a roll call, please. Alderman Dimmitt? Yes. Alderman Kramer? Yes. Alderman Leahy? Yes. Alderman Lockmiller? Yes. Alderwoman McNeil? Yes. Alderman Plufka? Yes. Ryan it's O'Neill, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. It's okay, we were all having a good laugh. Okay. <laughs> Alderwoman Sims? Yes. Alderman Wiggy? Yep. Okay, by a vote of eight to zero, the bills are paid. So the motion carries. Uh, reports of committees and department heads. Uh, under my report, I just have two quick things. Uh, first is, uh, Members of the Board of Aldermen, members of the Missouri Municipal League received in their email today a reminder to vote for the Missouri Innovation Awards. And we have a project that is up for a Missouri Innovation Awards. And so, uh, and when I clicked on the thing that said vote for uh, the award, 
uh, my survey monkey opened and I got to vote a second time. <laughs> so I was happy to do it and I voted for our project again. <laughs> I would encourage all of our aldermen to, uh, to, to check their city emails and uh, see if the uh, Missouri Municipal League has sent you an opportunity to vote again. And uh, if you are given that opportunity to vote for Project Numero Dos, which is the Brentwood Project. Um, and if you have any friends and neighbors that are, uh, you know, aldermen or whatever at cities other than Brentwood, feel free to call them up and tell them to vote for project number two. Uh, it's a good one. Uh, all right. So the second thing is uh, we have, speaking of voting, a general election tomorrow. And uh, in all seriousness, I know uh, I like to put in a joke every now and then, but in all seriousness, uh, voting is the absolutely most important thing that we do. It's the cornerstone of our republic. And uh, it's really absolutely shameful to me how many people have that opportunity that so many people gave so much for and they don't exercise it. So, uh, you know, I can't say it enough, get out and vote, get out and vote. Uh, we have four aldermen up for election this, uh, this term and I'm proud to say that none of them are being opposed. So all the folks to the left are sitting pretty. <laughs> uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, get out and vote, get out and vote, get out and vote. Call your friends, call your neighbors. Uh, it's really important. Uh, the polling places, as usual, will be here for Ward 2. Uh, they will be in Brentwood Forest Condominiums uh, Clubhouse for Ward 4. And Wards 1 and 3 will vote over at the Rec Center. So uh, please get out and vote. I know a number of the aldermen are planning to be out at the polls. Oh, we're back church. at the war. Oh, okay. I didn't realize they still had that going on. I'm sorry. So if you live in York or that part of Ward 1, uh, then you'll be voting at the church on McKnight Road. Uh, I believe it's a the UC, McKnight Road UCC. Church. Yeah, McKnight Road Church. So um, you'll see a number of your aldermen, uh, elected officials. I know there's a school board race that's very important for the city, so get out and do that. Um, that's it for me. Public Safety Committee, Alderman De uh, uh, Plufka. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Uh, thanks to Alderman Kramer for chairing the meeting, which was uh, last week. Um, we got our introduction to our new chief of police. He outlined uh, a number of initiatives that he's in the process of um, putting together, not only in connection with the school board, but also with our business leaders and with the businesses that are in Brentwood. He's also got plans to, um, to, to want to uh, uh, reinstitute or reconstitute the bike patrol program uh, and um, is going to make an effort I think also to um, change the way in which our police department does business on a day-to-day -day basis I, I thought it was a great presentation and uh, look forward to working with him in the future so thank you great thank you public works Alderman Lockmiller our next meeting for April will be on the 11th right here it's a Wednesday at 4 30 public works Director of Planning and Development. Thank you. Ways and Means, Alderman Dimmitt. I believe our next meeting, Mr. Chairman, is going to be this Thursday, uh, the 5th at 6 o'clock here. And we are going to be talking uh, in great detail about uh, the year-end numbers from 2017. So I invite you all to show up. Thursday at questions. 6 p.m. All right, I'm in. Mr. City Attorney. No report, sir. Madam City Administrator. No report, sir. Madam Excise Commissioner. No report. Madam Library Liaison. Uh, short report. The library staff is absolutely pleased with the cooperation of setting up voting procedures so that people can register and the uh, office here will send people downstairs to get the proper documentation. So they've moved quickly to coordinate that and it looks like a go. Fantastic. Along the lines of getting more people voting. Yes. Love it. Uh, I have nothing from the Municipal League other than to remind you to vote for the Missouri Municipal League of Innovation Awards uh, early and often. Early and often. <laughs> <laughs> Any announcements? Alderman Leahy. Thank you, Your Honor. The Ward 3 meeting for the month of April will be Tuesday night, the 24th of April, 7 o'clock up here in the council room, for all, and all are invited. Thank you. Thank you. Other announcements? Alderman Dimmitt, Alderman Plufka is trying to get your attention. Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, April, um, what? April meeting or no? April meeting. Do you yeah, sure. Go right ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for doing that. The election <laughs> first. We will meet. Yeah, we'll see how things go. I want to see if I win first, right? <laughs> <laughs> 
Board one will meet here at 6.30 on Tuesday, April 10th. Yes. All right, should we do Ward 4? Ward 4? Ward 4 will meet on the 24th also um, at 6 o'clock at the clubhouse before the ward meeting here. All right, any further announcements? Seeing none, we have on one item of new business this evening. It's a request for authorization to expand an existing per, uh, work order. So, uh, Alderman Kramer, I believe you have synopsis. I do, Your Honor. This is, the, as you stated, the request for the authorization to expand LNB architecture and interiors and the project scope for the City Hall Customer Experience Renovation Study Project, a motion authorizing the City Administrator to enter into and execute the change. This is change order number one. The City of Brentwood is committed to its residents and all with whom we have dealings to conduct its business in an efficient, responsive manner. Part of that commitment involves ongoing efforts to organize the city's affairs in City Hall in ways that will promote and enhance efficiency and the customer experience. The initial project scope was defined as improving City Hall only in areas in which the city interacts with customers. However, the expanded project scope offers an even greater access to the public by including the fire bay. It ensures they were in compliance with the American with Disabilities Act of 1990. The original contract cost was $24,200. The expanded scope is $2,500 additional. Updated total project contract, $26,700. The recommendation is for the Board of Aldermen to give a positive consideration to the expanded project scope with LNB Architecture and Interiors for the City Hall Customer Experience Renovation Study Project. And this is our new business this evening, change order number one. I would entertain a motion to approve change order number one from LNB Architecture and Interiors. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded that the Board of Aldermen approve change order number one to LNB Architecture and Interiors. Is there any discussion? Great. Uh, all in favor of approving change order number one, please say aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? By a vote of eight to zero, the approval is given. Uh, item number 19 on our agenda is a hearing of any matter of public interest upon the request of any person present. If you'd like to come forward and address the board on any topic, please do. You'll be given three minutes, at least. You might get a minute more, depending on who's winning the we'll game. We'll try not to do that. Mr. Mayor, <laughs> uh, Board of Aldermen, uh, Mike Horton, 2527 Kentland, still haven't moved. My apologies to the group. I feel like the kid who reminds the teacher at the last minute that she forgot to assign homework. However, in the discussion on the project, and uh, Alderman Leahy, correct, I, I would like your input on it if I get this wrong, because this goes mm -hmm. to, I think, your question. The project should cost $75 million, plus or minus. By my math, that means we're either going to pay $60 million or $90 million, somewhere in there. We are looking to get approximately $40 million from the COP. And this is the, the answer I never heard, because I don't know if the question really came out properly. Where's the rest of the money come from? <laughs> and that, I think, gets to the heart of what uh, That's Alderman That's a $65 Leighton, million dollar question. <laughs> yeah, and, and, and I, it, just, it, it just didn't come out, and I didn't hear that. And I don't necessarily expect an answer right this second, but... Uh, good, because you're not going to get one. <laughs> okay. All right. And that, that's just... I, we'll talk? Yes, 24th? Okay. We'll get you... To, yeah. right. we, uh, I'll, I'll address it. Mm -hmm. Any, uh, anyone else care to come forward and address the Board of Aldermen? Anyone? Anyone? All right. Seeing none, we have time for Aldermanic response. And since the question was sort of directed uh, at my answer to Alderman Leahy, I'll take it. So uh, the, the answer is we don't know. Uh, we don't know at this point, right? We, we have some ideas. We have an idea that if we choose to move forward with this project, we can, uh, we've been authorized by the statute to uh, impose an additional half cent economic development sales tax, right? Uh, we could vote to do that. Uh, we could vote to raise any number of special taxes in the area that's impacted by the project, right? Uh, we could go and, and begin assessing property taxes on the voters that they've already approved, right, which we have not assessed in many years. Or we could go to the voters and ask them to pay an additional property tax to raise funds to pay off the additional money. So the answer is we don't know. But, but to my point, and I, I think this is the part of the answer that's important, is 
without spending at least some portion of the money that we're talking about borrowing, and, and by that I mean a, a fairly significant portion, we simply won't ever know what the project's going to cost because it's, it's, the, it's a big enough project that in order to find out, you know, to, 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 to narrow that range from 60 to 90 million down to something that's more precise is going to take more money. And, and that's just all there is to it. So uh, what, we, what we are doing by doing this is we're, we're doing the necessary parts that will take a very long time, such as land acquisition. We're going to continue to spend money prudently on narrowing the scope and better defining the scope of the project. At that point in time, we will have a more definitive number, right? and, and we hope that it's not more than 75 million. All right? uh, and at that point in time, we can decide how to raise the balance between what we've already spent and the more definite number wherever it is, right? So, and we have a number, this amount of money gives us a number of years to make that decision, right? As we have more information, as we have more opportunity, then we can kind of address that. So, that's my answer to the question. I don't know how Alderman Leahy... I, Lahey I agree with what you're presenting. Any further Aldermanic response? Okay, seeing none. Uh, let's see, that brings us to item number 20 on the agenda, which I believe is a motion to go into a closed session. Your Honor, I'll make the motion that we do adjourn and reconvene in a closed session for a legal matter per the Missouri Revised Stat Statutes 610.21 subsection 1 for legal and 610.21 subsection 2 for real estate matter and then adjourn from that meeting and the regular meeting from the closed section. Second. Been moved and seconded that the board enter into a closed meeting pursuant to RS 610-21-1, uh, and adjourn therefrom. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, can we have a roll call, please? Alderman Dimmitt? Yes. Alderman Kramer? Yes. Alderman Leahy? Yes. Alderman Lockmiller? Yes. Alderwoman O'Neill? Yes. <laughs> Alderman Plufka? Yes. Alderwoman Sims? Yes. Alderman Wagey? Yes. All right, that's unanimous. We Where will reconvene like in the uh, conference room across the hall in precisely three minutes. Cool.